This is how I find my battles. 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 Yes, it is. It may look. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded. 
Hey, Van Church family and friends. I'm glad you're here. Uh, back in August, I got invited to go fishing with Ben Hill on his boat. And we went out to the mouth of the Columbia, and within about 15 minutes of getting to our spot, I caught a fish. <laughs> I know, me. I mean, I'm from Lubbock, Texas. Lubbock is flat, surrounded by cotton fields, and there's no water. I mean, it's so flat that you can watch your dog running away for three days. I was so excited to catch that fish. I thought this is going to be a great day. Well, not only was that the only fish that I caught that day, it was the only fish that anyone caught that day. We stayed out there for most of the morning, waiting and waiting. And you know what happened while we were out there waiting? The boat rocked and rocked, and we bounced around and around and around, and it wouldn't stop. Now, although I'm from Lubbock, Texas, where there's no water, I've actually been on boats lots of times, and I've never, ever, not one single time gotten seasick, except for that day. And we were just rocking up and down and side to side, and it wouldn't stop. I mean, I tried everything. I tried sitting still. I tried closing my eyes. I tried laying down. I tried walking to the front and then the back. I tried medicine and drinking water and chewing gum. And meanwhile, somebody else on the boat is saying that when he feels this way, you know, it's just better to go ahead and throw up and get it over with. And I'm telling you, I'll do just about whatever it takes to avoid throwing up. So I was pretty miserable for several hours. I had no peace, no comfort. There's only one thing that was going to help me land. Sweet, beautiful, solid ground land was my only hope. I'm guessing that you've had times in your life when you felt like I did on that boat. The waves of the world around you were causing chaos in your life and in your emotions and in your circumstances. Certainly all of us has felt some of this over the past year with all the craziness going on. And maybe you can remember a time in your life when your life was just getting rocked and you were not well. And you couldn't figure out how to make things right. You tried everything to get something to fall into place so that your world would settle and you could catch your breath or find solid ground. What I needed on that boat is what you needed in a time of chaos. You needed peace. Nothing else would do. Peace from the conflict. Peace from the uncertainty. Peace with someone in your life. Every one of us has lived in seasons where peace was hard to come by. And most of us have come to the realization in those times that there's not a thing that we can do to make things better. We need the kind of peace that only God can give. And the good news is that the Spirit of Jesus, the gift of God that we cannot earn or buy, when the Spirit of Jesus goes to work inside of us and in our hearts, the Spirit that only God can give will begin to cultivate in us the peace that only God can give. And I bet you're like me today. I need to be anchored and rooted and shaped by the peace that God gives because I'm a mess. And so, hear this good news today from the lips of Jesus himself when he says to his disciples in John 14, 25 through 27, All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus offers us his very own peace. And the peace of God takes three forms. The peace that God makes, the peace that God gives, and the peace God calls for. 
So I want to unpack each one of those. First is the peace that God makes. It's important to know and to realize that peace begins with God. God goes first. God shows us how to make peace because God himself has made peace with us and between us. Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22, where he talks about how God has reconciled Jews and Gentiles who hated each other. He writes this, Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and those who call uh, by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. And through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Because of what Jesus has done, by pouring out his life, he creates peace between us and God and between each other. He shows us how. I mean, we were enemies and Jesus repairs and restores us so that all of us together as a people might become a holy dwelling for God. That's amazing. Only God can do that. Second is the peace that God gives. God gives us peace with him. And that's astonishing because all of us had chosen to go our own way and live for ourselves, and we therefore lived as enemies of God's kingdom. But God, in his great love and compassion, did not destroy us as we deserved. Instead, God rescues us. In Romans 5, verses 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Do you know what that means? It means that because of Jesus, we don't have to worry about whether or not God is on our side. Because of Jesus, God has made peace with us and is with us. <laughs> That's the end of the story. We are his children. We've been welcomed to his table as his friends and as, as his family. We have peace with God. But it gets better. Not only does God make peace with us, God also gives us his peace. Jesus offers us his peace. That means that we don't have to live anxious and worried lives. Jesus assures us that God's got us. He says, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll wear. God's got you. And Paul echoes this when he writes in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, this isn't Hakuna Matata from Lion King. No worries. Just have a positive attitude. Just be detached from the outcome. Who cares? No worries. No. This, this kind of peace is about the everyday process of trusting that God's got us. Hakuna Matata says that the stuff in our life is really small, so we shouldn't really worry about it. No big deal. But the peace that God gives says that it doesn't matter how big and looming the stuff in your life is. And let's be honest, some of it's really big and scary. But the peace that God gives says that however big your problems are, God is bigger. God is stronger. God is more able. God is not threatened by your storm. God is master over the storm. And he's got you. So be at peace. And the third form of peace is the peace God calls for. And this is the hard one. Because God calls us to work for peace with other people in the way that we live every day. And since God has made peace with us, and since he's put his peace in us, God expects us now and calls us now to pursue lives of peace, to create peace, to cultivate it with one another. And here's where we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in us. Because let's be honest, we're terrible at this, and we always have been. In Romans chapter 12, it says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. And then down in verse 21, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a raging storm in our world right now, a storm filled with conflict and strife and war and violence and destroyed relationships, and it breaks God's heart. Jesus wants to rescue us from these cycles of fragmentation, and he wants to start by calming the raging storm in you. Jesus wants peace to bloom in your heart and to bring life to everyone around you. So today, once again, I want to identify a few ways that this fruit of the Spirit, this fruit of peace, how it might be getting choked out in our lives. Our culture is subtly sowing different seeds in our hearts that cultivate a different kind of fruit than that of the Spirit of peace. And so here are a few examples. The first competing fruit to the Spirit's peace has to do with demanding our rights. You remember those old Burger King commercials where you can have it your way right away at Burger King now? Well, I'd like my burger with no stinky onions, please, and I want it right now. (laughs) Our culture is full of opportunities for us to be nurtured into developing a sense of entitlement that we get to have things the way that we want. I mean, we talk about our rights all the time. We say that we have the right to do or to say whatever we want, to do whatever we want, to think whatever we want, because I have the right. Well, I hope you know that when you surrender to Jesus, if you're a Christian, you've surrendered your rights, all of them. I mean, how un-American is that? I mean, sorry, if you're going to follow Jesus, we no longer have the right to anything. Instead, we're bound to the law of love. We are enslaved to ask what mercy requires. We are obligated now to live a life of sacrifice and forgiveness. We no longer get to insist on our own way. We just don't. The second competing fruit I want to talk about is a big topic of conversation in our world right now, cancel culture. 
We live in a time where if someone believes differently than me or has different values than me, instead of talking to them and trying to work through our differences, instead of trying to understand where they're coming from, or if maybe I need to learn something from you, I can just cancel you instead. I can just dismiss you. I can assassinate your character and your worth, and I can ask other people to do the same. And I hope that we all understand that this is not the heart of Christ. Listen, it's one thing to speak up about injustice. I mean, calling out injustice is right and necessary, but in our efforts to confront evil, we must not ourselves become evil. In our efforts to resist the monsters of injustice, we must not become monsters toward each other. We must always work for justice and a better world in a way that leaves open the possibility of restoration and reconciliation. Otherwise, we aren't being peacemakers. We're just being war winners. And that's not who we're called to be. I mean, there's something else that I think needs to be said in conversations about cancel culture. I mean, some people are crying foul on cancel culture because they like to live in a world where they're allowed to say anything to anyone and treat everyone however they want with no accountability. And that gets us back to the toxic nature of my rights. The problem with all of this is that some people are saying, you know, oh, I remember the days when I had the right to call people fill in the blank, and no one would say anything about it. And that's just how we talked in those days. Then now everybody's just being so sensitive about everything. Well, here's my question about that attitude. If someone you love tells you that what you're saying or doing is hurtful to them, why would you insist upon your right to continue hurting them? Why would you express to them that you long to go back to a time when you could treat them that way and no one was going to call you out on it? I mean, why would you seek to shame them for asking you to treat them with dignity and respect? That attitude doesn't grow out of the spirit of love and peace. And many of us, all of us, we can do better. If we're going to cultivate peace of Jesus in us and in our relationships and in the world around us. Here are three practices that I want to mention today that we're invited to. And the first is to embrace baptism. Baptism is the fundamental pattern for living out the way of Jesus. Listen, baptism isn't just about getting your sins handled and moving from like one side of the ledger in God's mind to the other side. That's not really at all what it's about. It's when we're baptized, we are putting our old self to death and we are putting on the new life that Jesus has for us, his life. In fact, we're being united with him, incorporated with him in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection and new life. I mean, baptism isn't just something that you do once. It's a way that you're called to live every day. In baptism, I forfeit all my rights and all my other allegiances. And I join a new kingdom with a new kind of politics. A new way of living. And a new way of pursuing peace with those around me. And become part of a new family where we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The second practice is to commit to one anothering. The New Testament is full of one another statements for how we're supposed to treat each other and relate to each other. Here's just some of the many, many times that it says this. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another. Live in harmony with one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Encourage one another. Serve one another. Bear with one another. Be kind and compassionate toward one another. Submit to one another. Forgive one another. Admonish one another. Build one another up. Offer hospitality to one another. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. If 
you want the Spirit of God to cultivate peace in your life, make it your mission to live out these one another passages. And the third practice is for us to become shalom creators. Peace is ultimately about harmony and wholeness, shalom. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the shalom makers. They'll be called sons and daughters of God. And James says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And we're called to join God in bringing peace and wholeness to every place we see brokenness and fragmentation in the world, in relationships, in broken hearts. We're invited to take all that is hurt and lost, to bind it up and to try to make it whole again by God's power and grace, to bring life and healing to places without hope. A few years ago, I came across a beautiful story about a man named Fabio Chavez, Fabio is an environmental engineer who is working in a place called Katura, which is basically this gigantic trash heap outside the capital city of the South American country of Paraguay. Three million pounds of garbage are dumped there every day. And many of the nation's poorest people live nearby, and they scavenge among the trash for items that they might salvage in order to sell for a few cents. And there are numerous children in the area as well who don't go to school because their parents need them to help them sort through trash. Well, Fabio has a love for music and the power of music. And he realized that many of these young people, since they weren't in school and had no access to learning about music, and so he set out to do something about that. And so he started teaching these young people about music. But since none of them could afford musical instruments they started creating their own out of items found in the trash. And the result was an orchestra called the Landfill Harmonic. Let's watch this short video about it. Mi nombre es Ada Maribel Ríos Bogado, tengo 13 años y toco el violín. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Baby, tengo 19 años y toco el cello. Este cello está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoqui. Y suena así. Una comunidad como Cateura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. Y de ese empezamos los instrumentos reciclados. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa instrumento y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín siento como mariposas en el estómago, así una sensación que no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. Y mi vida sería 
Sin la música estaría de core y fre. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. No tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. Being a shalom creator, a peacemaker, means seeing how God can bring about something beautiful from something that's broken. I mean, that's what Jesus did in us. That's why we have peace with God, because Jesus saw in us something flawed and broken, and rather than throwing us away, he made us new. He brought something beautiful out of us. Being a shalom creator is about seeing value and dignity in other people. It's about planting seeds of love and joy and peace and grace and justice in the soil of despair and hurt and injustice. And so today, may the words of this prayer from St. Francis echo in our hearts. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And so now may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the spirit of life cultivate in you the peace of Jesus.
more than the next heartbeat, more than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I'll be by your side, cause I never to talk.